November 1953. In the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev has become Communist Party leader following the death of Joseph Stalin. In the USA, Senator Joseph McCarthy is investigating communist subversion in America. In Cambridge, England, Francis Crick and James Watson have unveiled their double helix structure for DNA. And elsewhere in England, scientists are about to expose the most audacious fraud in the history of archaeology. Saturday morning, the quiet suburban town of Amersham in Buckinghamshire. How was the lecture last night, darling? Well, I went in a large well, modern bungalow, seven-year-old Giles Oakley waits for breakfast to finish so he can go outside and ride his bicycle. Giles, come and have your breakfast. His father, Dr. Kenneth Oakley, is a geologist and anthropologist at the Natural History Museum. Giles. Let him play, darling. He'll come when he's ready. Last night, he gave a talk to the Royal Institution of Great Britain as part of a series of lectures in the run-up to Christmas. Some uh, one or two distinguished names there. His subject was the dawn of man in South Africa. Yeah, so, all in all, I was, uh, I was rather pleased with the whole thing. Interesting though it was, this topic has not been at the forefront of his mind in recent months. Instead, his attention has been focused on a far more sensational piece of research. A journalist from the Times. His work in trying to solve the riddle of Piltdown Man. In November 1912, the startling discovery was announced of the remains of what was claimed to be the earliest known human being. The finds were made in a gravel pit near the village of Piltdown in Sussex. They included several pieces of human skull, the fragment of a lower jaw, and a canine tooth. When the skull was reconstructed, it seemed that the shape of the head resembled modern man, while the jaw and teeth were more ape-like. Piltdown man was therefore heralded as the long-awaited missing link between ape and human. Finally, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution was proven beyond any reasonable doubt. But during the last four months, Kenneth Oakley has succeeded in proving that Piltdown Man, the most high-profile archaeological phenomenon of the century, is a hoax. Oh, is that the paper? This extraordinary revelation is made in a report written jointly by himself and two fellow scientists from Oxford University, Joe Viner and Wilfred Legros Clark. The report was due to be published in the scientific journal Nature in a few days' time. But last night after his lecture, Dr Oakley was approached by a journalist from the Times who persuaded him to reveal details of the report. Oh, there it is. Mm. Piltdown Man Forgery, elaborate hoax. The startling discovery that one of the most famous of anthropological specimens, the Piltdown Skull, is a forgery, has been made as a result of investigations... The other newspapers are furious. The the they believe the Natural History Museum, as a public body, should have broken the news to everyone fairly. But it's too late. The news is out, and the Times has the scientific scoop of the year. Mm. Oakley's colleague, Dr. Joe Viner, is on his way to Amersham. An anthropologist from Oxford University, Viner was the first to spot that Piltdown Man might be a clever hoax. In the 1920s and 30s, other examples of early man had been discovered in Africa and Asia. But strangely, they bore no resemblance to Piltdown Man. England's sensational archaeological discovery had become an embarrassing misfit. We were travelling back to Oxford one evening after a conference at which we'd been discussing the Piltdown problem. I was wondering how one could possibly explain the curious contradictions of these finds. 
That night, Viner worked into the early hours trying to solve the puzzle. He became convinced that Piltdown Man must be a forgery. But the identity of the perpetrator still remains a mystery. Today, Viner is on a mission to root out the audacious hoaxer. A chief suspect is the eminent 87-year-old anatomist Sir Arthur Keith. At the time of the Piltdown discovery, Keith was curator of the Hunterian Museum at the Royal College of Surgeons. He had both the knowledge and ability to carry out the hoax. Viner is particularly suspicious of Keith's behavior once the Piltdown finds were announced. Keith claimed initially to be skeptical of the way the skull was reconstructed, but then switched, becoming a key advocate for the finds. He even published a book, The Antiquity of Man, in which Piltdown Man took centre stage in the process of human evolution. Now, with the news out that the discovery was a hoax, Keith knows he will face tough questions about what took place in the small village of Piltdown almost 50 years ago. The first fragment of skull from Piltdown was discovered in 1908 by a well-respected solicitor and amateur antiquarian, Charles Dawson. An important local figure in his hometown of Uckfield, Dawson was nicknamed the Wizard of Sussex, thanks to the number and importance of his archaeological finds. He was even responsible for identifying three new species of dinosaur, one of which was later named Iguanodon Dorsoni. At some time in the late 1890s, business took Dawson to Barkham Manor, an estate near the village of Piltdown in Sussex. He went for a walk and noticed labourers digging an ancient gravel pit in search of stones to mend the farm's roads. As I surmised that any fossils found in the gravel would probably be interesting, I specially charged the men to keep a lookout. When he returned to the manor in 1908, his forward thinking paid off. Oh, my man. Have you found anything? No, oh, sir. Just here. Not sure if it's anything. Huh? One of the labourers oh. handed to me a small piece of bone, which I recognised as being really a portion of human cranium. <laughs> I had once made a long search but could find nothing more. Um, just about, about there, sir. Oh. Over the next four years, Dawson visited the gravel pit several times. By 1912, he had accumulated another large piece of skull and a fragment of hippopotamus tooth. On the 28th of March, he wrote to the keeper of geology at the Natural History Museum. Arthur Smith Woodward was widely regarded as a world authority in his field and had been a friend of Dawson's for 25 years. With the promise that he would be the first to view the finds, Dawson invited Smith Woodward to Sussex to have a thorough look at the gravel pit. I would of course take care that no one sees the pieces of skull who has any knowledge of the subject and leave all to you. On second thoughts, I have decided to wait until you and I can go over by ourselves to look at the bed of gravel. It is not far to walk from Uckfield and it will do us good. Smith Woodward eagerly accepted and plans were made for the excavation to begin in three months time. It is what happened during this infamous excavation in the summer of 1912 that Dr. Viner knows is pivotal to discovering the identity of the hoaxer. With the help of Kenneth Oakley and staff at the Natural History Museum, he has launched an extensive inquiry. He intends to question every survivor, either present at the dig itself or closely involved with the study of the finds. 
Today, they're targeting one of their prime suspects. When the excavation first began in June 1912, Dawson and Smith Woodward's progress was agonizingly slow. Very, very disappointing. It is, but very. I'm sure, sure there's something here. Oh, absolutely. Could you give me some more, please? Yes, some more, okay. yes. The discovery of bones and teeth, all stained brown in a dark-colored gravel, which was full of bits of ironstone and brown flints, needed very close and slow examination of every fragment. That's first wonderful find. Absolutely. Every spadeful had to be watched and generally passed through a sieve. But during the ensuing months, the two men's painstaking efforts gradually appeared to yield results. It is! Yes. It is! Yes. Between them, they found several more fragments of skull, a number of flints, some fossilized animal bones, and what appeared to be a piece of the lower jaw. It amounted to an astonishing haul. Smith Woodward was a skilled geologist. Using the fragments, he was able to reconstruct what he believed to be the original shape of the skull. The results were guaranteed to stun the world. On the evening of the 18th of December 1912, at a meeting of the Geological Society in London, Dawson and Smith Woodward <coughs> unveiled their discovery. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming along to Burlington House this evening. May we present to you the Anthropus Dawsoni, the Piltdown Man. The atmosphere in the room was charged with excitement. Here in England was tangible and incontrovertible proof of man's ape-like ancestry. The areas of the skull that you see in brown were all excavated locally. For years, so scientists idea. had been anticipating the discovery of the missing link in human evolution, a creature that possessed a large enough brain to house a superior intelligence, but which had not yet lost its ape-like jaw and fighting teeth. Piltdown man confirmed these expectations. So you can see, I think, marked differences between Piltdown Man and a normal human skull. That the find was both authentic and of great antiquity was not questioned. And when we look at the human jaw... But there were some voices of dissent. You can see very marked difference there. Arthur the Keith, an anatomist from the Hunterian Museum, was unhappy with the way Woodward had reconstructed the skull from the fragments that he and Dawson had found. All been found on site. But the following summer, a decisive piece of evidence was unearthed. A single canine tooth was found close to the spot where the jaw had been discovered. Its shape, size, and the way it had been worn flat was exactly as Smith Woodward had predicted in his initial reconstruction of the Piltdown skull. Keith was forced to admit his mistake, and Piltdown Man as presented at the Geological Society meeting, was widely accepted as accurate. In 1915, a group portrait was painted for the Royal Academy's annual exhibition. It symbolized the new unity of the scientists. Entitled, A Discussion on the Piltdown Skull, it featured all those closely associated with the discovery. At the back, in front of a painting of Charles Darwin, is Charles Dawson. Next to him is Arthur Smith Woodward. And seated prominently at the front, examining the reconstructed skull, is the eminent anatomist Arthur Keith, now a powerful advocate in the defense of Piltdown Man.
Today, less than 50 years later, as the news breaks that Piltdown Man was a hoax, Keith is the only scientist from the original group still alive. Dawson died soon after his great discovery, in August 1916, aged just 52. The exact cause of his illness remains unknown. Smith Woodward continued his passionate support of Piltdown Man for 30 years, before his death of old age in September 1944. But Keith, now Sir Arthur Keith, has since enjoyed a long and illustrious career as a world-renowned anatomist. Now retired, he lives in the village of Down in Kent, where he is writing a biography of Charles Darwin. Today, he's also Oakley and Viner's chief suspect in the hunt to find the Piltdown Man hoaxer. Viner, Oakley, and Oakley's wife, Margaret, set off from the house in Amersham at lunchtime. They are making the journey to Kent to cross-examine Keith over his involvement in Piltdown Man. Viner is suspicious of the way Keith abandoned his initial skepticism of the skull. He also can't believe such an eminent scientist could have missed the more obvious signs of forgery. Before the hoax was announced, Oakley wrote to Keith requesting an interview and last week received a very courteous reply. My dear Oakley, you will find me here on Saturday morning, 21st November, and glad to see Mrs. Oakley, Dr. Viner, and you. You have been a much traveled man of late. Yours sincerely, Arthur Keith. Now the news of the hoax is out. The men are worried Keith may not be quite so welcoming. Hurry up. Sorry, Giles is being rather naughty. How do I look? Marvelous. Good, we really must go now. Oakley has asked Margaret to come with them, believing she may be able to smooth the waters if the conversation becomes hostile. Also, she's an attractive woman, and Keith is known to have a soft spot for the ladies. Viner and Oakley first began to run tests on Piltdown Man three months ago. At their disposal were several cutting-edge techniques, which had not been available to archaeologists when the bones were first discovered. First, Oakley took samples from the skull and jawbone. Immediately, his suspicions were aroused. When the bones were being drilled, the skull fragments were odorless, as you would expect with ancient fossils but the jawbone gave off a distinctive smell of burning horn, a phenomenon common with fresh bone. Next, Oakley applied the fluorine test, the very latest technique for dating fossils and a method which he had pioneered. Fluorine is a poisonous element, rather like chlorine, which is absorbed by bones from the water in the soil or subsoil in which they are buried. Put simply, the longer a bone is in the ground, the more fluorine it absorbs. While the skull fragments contained relatively high levels of fluorine, dating them as late ice age, the jawbone contained a minuscule amount. This confirmed Oakley's suspicion that the bone was modern. He now turned his attention to the color of the Piltdown Man fossils. The majority were brown, consistent with being buried for a long time in iron-rich soil. But Oakley suspected some had been stained to make them appear much older than they were. When hydrochloric acid was applied to the jawbone, his hunch paid off. The color rubbed off easily, exposing fresh white bone underneath. Finally, Oakley and Viner examined the surface of Piltdown Man's teeth. Now, it quickly became obvious that the bone had been filed down. Now here, on this copy of the Piltdown jaw, you can see the extraordinarily flat wear of the two molars. An entirely unnatural kind of wear, uh, hardly to be expected. 
As a comparison, Viner filed down the jawbone of a modern chimpanzee. The result looked remarkably similar to Piltdown Man. The two scientists had all the proof they needed. It is now obvious that the hoaxer must have had a highly sophisticated grasp of both archaeology and human anatomy. With this in mind, who were the most likely suspects? Dawson had both the motive and the opportunity. He was an ambitious amateur, desperate to make a big discovery, and was present when all the finds were made. But many doubted he had the expertise to carry out such a convincing hoax, at least not without help. Smith Woodward was a highly qualified geologist, but he'd wasted the last 20 years of his life excavating sites around Piltdown and coming up with nothing. Hardly the behavior of a hoaxer. Arthur Keith not only had the skills to carry out the hoax, he'd suspiciously switched from criticizing the finds to giving them his wholehearted support. Could he have been the hoaxer's accomplice? The brains behind the elaborate forgery which had fooled the scientific community for so long. Viner has some serious questions to put to the eminent anatomist. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. We have an appointment to see Sir Arthur. Certainly, sir. Come this way. We found Keith more or less confined to his bedroom study, in which he had collected all of his most important books and papers. And you must be Mrs Oakley. That's right. Please sit down. Thank you. He did not look very well. He was pale and rather pinched looking and shaky and had a cough. I have seen it all in the Times. I'm glad you've come down, and I hope you've brought some specimens to show me. Oh, yes. Oakley starts by showing Keith the samples of bone. We uh, decided to take some fresh samples from the pilt. He describes the strong smell of burning when the bones were drilled. I thought this was very odd because in my experience, it is fresh bone that produces that smell, and not bone, which we all thought was half a million years old. He then produces a cast of the Piltdown jawbone, and explains portion. that when Dr. Viner filed down the jaw of a modern ape, it looked almost identical. Now, we discovered that these back teeth here must have been filed down. I'm sorry, but I've handled many chimpanzee and orang mandibles, and I just cannot believe I would have been so easily deceived. Also, I'm far from certain that filing down the teeth would have produced a result such as this. Have you filed both orang and chimpanzee? No, only chimpanzee. But it produced a very similar appearance. If you say so, Dr. Viner, I must accept it. Reluctantly, Keith agrees that the jaw is a forgery. But unfortunately for Viner, he has made no admission of guilt or given any clues as to who the Piltdown hoaxer might be. Halfway through the conversation, Oakley inadvertently makes a breakthrough. What further tests revealed was that the jaw had been stained using bichromate potash. Oh, I, I knew the jaw was stained. It was done to preserve it. Staining bones with bichromate potash was not an accepted way of preserving bones, even in 1912. Well, how had you learned of the chromate staining? From Dawson. I had lots of correspondence from Dawson. Most of it, if not all of it, I destroyed in a bonfire many years ago. We also tested the bones for At the, the time, Keith appears to have dismissed Dawson's unorthodox methods as an amateur's misguided attempt to preserve the bones. But now the hoax is out, Viner and Oakley consider Dawson's actions to be highly suspicious. You are making reflection on a Christian gentleman. We realize this is unfortunately the case. I like Dawson a lot. He was an honest, open chap. I, I often talked to him. 
were you not surprised by the number of specimens yielded by the Piltdown Pit? Yes. <laughs> I felt they kept on finding things with which to confute me. As far as Viner and Oakley are concerned, it's obvious that Keith played no part in the Piltdown Man hoax. They prepare to leave. Would you be so kind as to autograph a copy of your biography for me? Why, of course. That's so kind. They now believe Keith's failure to spot the forgery or question Dawson more closely about the staining was the result of an overwhelming academic desire to accept the authenticity of Piltdown Man rather than anything more sinister. Thank you. Well, goodbye, Sir Arthur. Goodbye, Professor Oakley. Goodbye, Mrs Oakley. Goodbye. Goodbye, Sir Professor Viner. We left about 3.50 p.m. He was rather tired, but not, I think, very agitated. Having eliminated Keith from their inquiries, Viner and Oakley focus all their efforts on Charles Dawson. Over the next few months, they will build a strong case against him. But the evidence remains largely circumstantial. Viner is forced to conclude that he cannot prove beyond all reasonable doubt that Dawson was the hoaxer. The unearthing of the Piltdown Man hoax turns Oakley and Viner into minor celebrities. While Oakley relishes some aspects of his newfound fame, even appearing on an American version of What's My Line, the media attention ultimately proves a distraction from their other scientific achievements. A year later, on the 7th of January 1955, Sir Arthur Keith dies convinced that Dawson was the culprit. In a letter published posthumously in the Times, he said the news of the hoax left me in no doubt that the man I had the greatest reverence for had deliberately misled his best friend Smith Woodward and me. Since the 1950s, several of Charles Dawson's earlier archaeological finds have also been re-examined and proven to be forgeries. They include a Roman statuette, which Dawson claimed was the earliest evidence of cast iron manufacture in Europe, but which has since been exposed as a modern copy. Hello, sir. Have you found anything But despite this, Just this, there remains no conclusive proof that it was Dawson, and Dawson alone, who perpetrated the most daring fraud in the history of science. The identity of the Piltdown Man hoaxer remains a mystery.